On the news, ministers designate begin documentation ahead of Monday's swearing in. President Tinubu meets with NLNG board about to remove impediments to gas utilization. And CBN introduces new operational mechanism for BDC operations in Nigeria. For many thanks for joining us on News Now, I am Fola Shadi Ogurinde. Ahead of Monday's swearing-in ceremony of members of the Federal Executive Cantu FEC, 45 ministers designate have begun their documentation at the Office of Secretary to the Government of the Federation in Abuja. The exercise, which was ongoing on Saturday afternoon, followed the assignment of portfolios to the ministerial appointees by President Bolatinbo on Wednesday. The Senate had confirmed the appointment of 45 ministerial nominees out of a list of 48 names forwarded to it for confirmation by President Balatinubu. The Senate, however, withheld confirmation of the appointment of three nominees, namely Nassel El Rufai from Kaduna State, Stella Okotete from Delta State, and Abubakar Sani Denladi from Taraba State over security concerns. Despite the euphoria that greeted the designation of ministers with portfolios, experts have examined the task ahead of the chosen men and women who will work with President Balatinubu. Political affairs analyst who spoke on TV360 Niger's flagship program, DG360, say the choice of officers is crucial to drive the affairs of the country. They have a uh, expressed concern about the size and nature of the cabinet, adding that the lack of ideologies upon which the ministries will be run will pose a challenge for the new ministers. There's no way the ministers are not going to struggle. In the first instance, one, you have a large federal executive council. Two, um, there, was, there is no ideology that, um, like he pointed out, what is the ideology upon which the ministries are going to be run, mm. which is the party, the party policies, programs, and, and manifesto. And three, is that you are seeing conflagration of different types of interest group coming together to constitute this cabinet. Four, you have a lot of chief executive, former chief executive, people that have been almighty, imperial majesties. Mm. You have too many former governors in this cabinet. So a lot of a lot of people that don't answer to anybody that were the alpha and omega in their respective state, now being part and parcel of a cabinet in which they have to bring their memo for discussion. In the past, their memo are not even questioned. Whatever is presented at the state mm. executive council is, 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 is run through. So, so as far as it will take a lot of time for them to adjust, to even those that have the political experience, it will take a lot of time for them to adjust. This bulging of the cabinet is really not uh, uh, the, 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 the best. But more importantly, let me add, uh, a government comes into existence not really knowing because they are not God. They don't even know what are going to be their major challenges ahead. They should be able to be, to, 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 to to work together, to be able to to, 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 to to do things along that can give the government a direction. Let me give you an example. Tinubu, nobody, not nobody in Nigeria, probably nobody in the world knew that the first few months of Tinubu would be decided by Niger, Ecowas, the talk of war, and so on. It might be the deciding factor for his, his, his government or even his life for the rest of it, but it has come, it is there. So uh, 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 he needs uh, a cabinet that can work together to address common uh, uh, challenges and at the same time be able to perform the other roles that are conventional and expected. President Balatinubu's pledge is administration's commitment to leveraging the nation's massive gas resources to achieve the fundamental restructuring of the nation's economy for expansive growth during its tenure. President Tinubu gave the pledge during a meeting with the board and management of the Nigeria Liquefied Natural Gas Limited at the presidential villa in Abuja, saying the leveraging will be for domestic utilization, processing and international export. 
President Tinubu appreciated the difficulties faced by the NLNG, particularly on security, affirming that stakeholders, including the host communities and security agencies, will play more central roles in the resolution of troublesome points of contention for more peaceful and profitable operations on a sustainable basis. To get the economy moving again is one of the top priorities of the, the program of this administration. So we, from our own part, discuss issues that are related to reviving the economy. For us, just two words will describe it, security and gas supply. They go together. All security, that will unlock more gas to plants. We can produce at a higher capacity and we make more revenue. We pay our taxes, huge amounts of taxes and dividend declarations. All that will have an upshot if we can tackle those two major problems. The Central Bank of Nigeria, CBN, has announced operational mechanism for the Buru Dejaj segment of the market to trade foreign currencies at similar rates obtainable on the investor and exporter forex window. In a circular, the CBN explained that the additional guidelines is in a bid to improve efficiency of the Nigerian foreign exchange market. The decision comes two years after the Apex Bank banned the sale of dollars to BDCs amid efforts to stabilize the market. However, the latest directive does not state that the central bank will resume the sale of dollars to the BDCs. The Apex Bank warned that non-rendition of returns would attract sanctions, which may include withdrawal of operating license with effect from the date of the circular. Well, earlier I spoke to the President Association of Baruta Judge Operators of Nigeria, Aminu Gwadabe, and I began by asking him the impact of CBN's regulations on BDC operators in the country. So now they are looking into revisiting that uh, suspension so that they will ensure that the Baruta change are uh, also involved or included into the new harmonized market. And in doing that first, they have to come out with a rate anchor. So this is what we call a rate anchor, so that you won't be cutting rate in a tinkle of eye. So they are trying to ensure that there is an anchor rate that will guide their operation in the first instance. And that is why they come up with that minus 2.5% and plus 2.5%. It should be minus 2.5% of that 800 Naira, the closing average rate of the IE window. And same if I'm selling, my selling rate should be plus 2.5% above the IIE weighted average rate that closed yesterday. Well, that was the President Association of Buru Dajanj Operators of Nigeria, Aminu Gwadabe, speaking on the new operational guidelines for BDC operators in Nigeria. Moving on now, former President Muhammad Buhari has expressed his sadness over the death of several soldiers killed in an ambush and a subsequent helicopter crash in Niger State. According to the Defense Headquarters, 36 officers were killed in both ambush attacks and an evacuation helicopter crash. Buhari, in a statement signed by his spokesman, Gaba Shehu, also sent his condolences to President Bolatinabu over the tragedy. The Committee of Chiefs of the Fund Staff of the Economic Community of West African States, ECOWAS, say it has fine-tuned its military intervention plans in Niger Republic. On Thursday, ECOWAS said it had begun the activation of its standby force in the Niger Republic to restore constitutional order. Speaking during the closing ceremony of the two-day meeting on Friday, ECOWAS Commissioner for Political Affairs, Peace and Security, Abdel Fatal Musa said the defense chiefs had agreed on a day to intervene. Musa added that the regional body is still seeking to engage peacefully with Niger's military leaders. ECOWAS had agreed to use force as a last resort if diplomatic efforts failed to restate ousted President Mohamed Bazoum was toppled and detained since July 26 coup. The military junta had also defied the bloc's deadline to relinquish power, leading to ECOWAS' deployment of standby military troops last week. For more on that story, Fidel Owusu, who is an international affairs analyst, joins me now from Ghana. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. Now, does ECOWAS' determination to intervene militarily necessarily uh, assure strength? 
Um, well, um, th th thank you very much for this opportunity. Um, I believe that um, whatever that is happening in the region is not making anyone happy. Uh, the junta itself is not happy that this is happening, and the ECOWAS uh, um, at large is not also happy. But the most important thing is that as a regional organization, they want to uh, show that they have some teeth to bite. And so this meeting was to send a clear message that, look, intervention is not off the table. We are going to use diplomacy or the political solution to solve this problem. However, if all options fail, then we will militarily intervene in order to restore democracy back in Niger. So we, we see that um, beyond Niger Republic now, there are other states um, that are currently facing the same situation. But we didn't see, you know, the same, um, you know, response that we are seeing now from ECOWAS. So why is Niger Republic different? Yes, this is very important. Now, uh, in Mali and Burkina Faso, when the coups happened, the junta mainly blamed the whole thing on insecurity, that the Al-Qaeda affiliates and ISIS affiliates running amok in the region are causing instability, and the civilian governments are not having the capacity or the competence to direct the military as to what to do in order to fight violent extremism. So in a way, some people or some regional actors had understood the situation in the case of Mali and Burkina Faso. Even then, there were some sanctions that were uh, put on these countries. But Niger relatively was stable. In fact, even though uh, Boko Haram and other groups are terrorizing parts of Niger, Recording in Niger, progress. Has been, Niger, Niger has been very, very um stable or comparatively stable if you would compare them with, it with the rest of these countries that has coup or military junta ruling them and so when it's happening in niger people thought that well if niger that has relative stability or security is facing this then definitely it will move on to other more stable countries or more peaceful countries like benin Republic of Benin, like Nigeria, like Ghana, and other places, Cote d'Ivoire, and, and so on and so forth. So ECOWAS is now becoming more conscious of being preventive rather than reactive to coup, so that if um, it uh, intervened in Niger or put more or harsher sanctions, then it becomes deterrence to other soldiers who are planning to do the same in other jurisdictions. So reports are just coming in now that um, the ECOWAS uh, military uh, are in Niger uh, currently. W what do you make of this? Well, uh, that is not fully established. Uh, last time when I was having an interview with your uh, news agencies, uh, the breaking news came in. However, Niger is a very vast area that any penetration or any establishment of some force will not be too difficult because you can even go and start from the desert in the north or in the uh, eastern section where there is sparsely populated but in the south where the population is very uh, more dense or more uh, concentrated you will not have it easy because then the junta is well established in the south where the population is is, is more concentrated so any part of niger can be a starting point for an ECOWAS force or standby force. However, the most important thing is taking Niamey, which is the capital of Niger. If you took the capital, then you have an advantage. However, as I mentioned the other time, after taking that capital, you will then have to face either a guerrilla warfare or other um, tactics that may not be too comfortable for ECOWAS forces. Well, um, I beg your pardon, Fidel. It's the ECOWAS uh, delegation, but um, still, um, it's a wait and see situation. And we hopeful, we are hopeful that um, the Niger junta uh, will see reason with ECOWAS and you know form an agreement or uh, release um, the, the president, that's uh, President Mohamed Bazoum. But um, Fidel Uwosu, international affairs analyst, thank you very much for joining us and for your insight. Moving on, the Center for Human Rights and Socioeconomic Justice in Lagos 
has held a press briefing over alleged corruption and misappropriation of funds by the immediate past Minister of State Petroleum, Timipur Silva, while in office. Speaking at the briefing, the convener Declan Ihekere said the groups have petitioned the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission, EFCC, demanding proper investigation over alleged illegal activities and abuse of office of the former minister during the last administration. Yet that the former minister claimed to have used 14.5 million to purchase Biro and 46 million for letterhead paper, which the group sees as absurd. We are here as a concerned civic group to demand a thorough investigation into the allegations of corruption involving the immediate past Minister of State for Petroleum, Mr. Timmy Pre mm -hmm. Sevier, during his tenure in office. We have petitioned the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission to demand a thorough probe into the activities of Mr. Sevier during his time in office as the Minister of State for Petroleum Resources. Um, a petition has been submitted to the ESCC and the petition was acknowledged with a letter that we have received. But up to now, nothing has been done. We'll take a break here, but still to come. Sweden beats Australia to claim bronze medal. We'll bring you details of the story after this break. In the last three years, we have built a multi-purpose center, which is the envy of all in our constituency. And I can tell you that the people who are living there are already enjoying it. Guy, do you think what this man just said is true? See, I seriously doubt. I'm sure it's one of those that are silly lies. And wait, do you know there's a way to find out if these things he's saying is true or not? Ah. This is the construct app. It gives people like us a sure way to track implementation of constituency projects. It gives valid and verified information on location of projects, amounts allocated, amounts funded, the level of job done, and even the profiles of concerned legislators. You and I can post directly on this app. Are you serious? This is the go-to app. If you want to know how our commonwealth is being expanded by the government. Wow. Let's even see if what this man said is true. Show me. The Construct app is developed by Other People Nigeria with support from USAID and is available on both Google Play Store and Apple Store. Eh, that is true. <laughs> of course, I told you. Welcome back to News Now, a recap of some of our top stories tonight. Ahead of Monday's swearing in ceremony of members of the Federal Executive Council, 45 ministers designated have begun their documentation at the Office of Secretary to the Government of the Federation in Abuja. The exercise, which was ongoing on Saturday afternoon, followed the assignment of portfolios to the ministerial appointees by President Bola Ahmed Tinubu on Wednesday. We also told you that President Bola Tinubu's pledge is administration's commitment to leveraging the nation's massive gas resources to achieve the fundamental restructuring of the nation's economy for expansive growth during its tenure. President Tinubu gave the pledge during a meeting with the board and management of the Nigeria Liquefied Natural Gas Limited at the presidential villa in Abuja, saying the leveraging would be for domestic utilization, processing and international export. But in case you missed any of our news bulletins, so for more updates, you can catch us on Limex World TV or log on to our website on www.tv360niger.com. You can also follow us on our social media platforms on Twitter, Instagram and YouTube at TV360 Nigeria. On Facebook, we are TV360 Online.
Welcome back. And in business, the Nigerian bank settlement system says banks in the country have lost about 9.5 billion naira so far in 2023. This was disclosed by the managing director of NIBSS, Premier Owei, at the Nigeria Electronic Fraud Forum, third quarter parley held in Lagos. The MD, who was represented by the NIBSS Chief Risk Officer Timidayo Adekanye, linked the worrying increase in electronic fraud in the nation's financial sector to the online gambling industry. He explained that the cashless policy of the Apex Bank is partly responsible for the increase in e-fraud in the financial sector. The announcement of an emergency $3 billion crude oil repayment loan by the Nigeria National Petroleum Company Limited has doused attention in the forex market as the Naira appreciated at both the official investors and exporters forex window and the parallel market. But industry watchers say without an improvement in the nation's crude oil production level, the relief is only temporary. For more details in this report. Africa's largest economy, Nigeria is supported majorly from crude oil sales. But in recent years, the quantity of crude oil production has dipped significantly, no thanks to pipeline vandals and oil thieves. Not only has this affected the economy, it has also weakened the value of the Naira. To reverse this trend, the Nigeria National Petroleum Company Limited and Afrexim Bank have jointly signed a commitment letter and term sheets for an emergency $3 billion crude oil repayment loan. What they've done is simply said, hey, we want to get advanced payments on crude oil sales that we're going to make. So now when Nigeria sells crude oil, it goes to JP Morgan, then it's moved from JP Morgan to FARC and then it's shared. And then PC has gone to the bank and said, hey, we're going to earn maybe 10 billion. We want you to give us three billion in advance of what we're going to earn. Give it to us now. So we are spending tomorrow's revenues today. Although three billion dollars is not so much money for an economy of our own size, uh, but in the short term, if we're able to restore stability in the market, if we're able to reduce the level of uh, you know uh, crisis of confidence that was developing in the market, uh, then things will begin to stabilize. Because this is not just going to be uh, a single policy action. Uh, this step has to be complemented with other measures of governments regarding the reform of the economy. But experts warn that the relief is only temporary if the government does not tackle the root problem of crude oil theft. In July, Nigeria's daily crude oil production fell to average 1.08 million barrels per day compared to 1.25 million barrels per day recorded in June. This slump is a drawback as the federal government has a production target of 1.69 million barrels per day in the 2023 budget. We're not addressing the issue, but we're looking for a palliative to the crude oil theft. But this is a short-term measure. Perhaps there's a larger plan to go after the oil theft and we need to buy ourselves time. We've also got to address the banditry inside Nigeria that is preventing farmers from farming and producing food. So we're importing PMS, we are also importing food. We need to stop these two so the Naira can firm up and the exchange can also get uh, more inflows. Also, remittances is also going to be a big factor. The volume of each installment of the foreign exchange expected and the quantity of crude oil to be repaid is unclear, but the federal government says the emergency $3 billion crude oil repayment loan is an upfront cash loan against proceeds from a limited amount of future crude oil production. For Lashade Ogurinde, TV360 News. On the foreign scene, North Korea has lashed out at the UN for accusing the Pyongyang regime of widespread systemic human rights violations and called North Korean defectors who had escaped from hardships humans come. 
The name calling came after the nuclear armed state was held accountable at the UN Security Council meeting on Thursday. After spending heavily on its nuclear arms program while its people go hungry and lack basic necessities, Eo Kim, a North Korean defector, told the council that he had been forced at a young age to work in fields without compensation and that the grain they grew all went to the military. Well, up next is Entertainment Report on News Now. Nigerian TikToker Ego, who was convicted for defaming actress Eniola Badmos, has claimed that she was physically assaulted while in custody. Taken to social media, Ego alleged that she was subjected to a gang beating by individuals connected to Badmos, a detail that was not made public. Describing the brutality of the attack, Ego said she has undisclosed information about her arrest, but she recalled about six people beating her for her offense, leaving marks on her body. Ego was convicted on two counts of cyber stalking on Wednesday, August 2, 2023, which she pled guilty. She was sentenced to three years in prison with the option of paying 150,000 naira in fine, which she paid. Emmanuel Mayam, known as Emmy Works, a fan of Afrobeat star David Doe, who embarked on a road trip with his bicycle from Benue State to Lagos to meet the singer, has arrived at his destination. He arrived in the commercial city on Friday after spending 15 days cycling across states to deliver a special gift to his favorite singer. The cyclist had rallied support from other social media users to ensure the information gets to Davido. In his response, Davido maintained he is not home and urged the fan to turn around and go back home, asking the cyclist to send his bank account details. But defiant Emmy Walks insisted on coming to Lagos to see Davido. He was warmly received and given a heroic welcome by the Thief community in Lagos. Well, that's all on the entertainment segment of News Now. Away from entertainment and outer sports, Sweden has clinched the bronze medal at the Women's World Cup with a 2-0 win over co-host Australia in Brisbane. Sweden picked up their fourth Women's World Cup bronze medal after beating co-host Australia 2-0 in the third place playoff in Brisbane. Sweden ranked third in the world where awarded a penalty in the 28th minute after a VAR review showed Claire Hunt had clipped Stina Black Stenius's heels with Fridolina Rolfo scoring the resulting sport kick. Australia toyed as they desperately tried to get back into the game but after seven exhausting games they looked fatigued and their extraordinary campaign ended in leap fashion. And that's the size of our news bulletin. Many thanks for watching. I am Fola Shade Okorindi. Bye for now.